So the Sydney Opera House story is one that'll be familiar to some of you, and I'll take you through some glorious photos before I get to the hard part, which might be the fine print that's difficult to read. The Opera House is sited on a peninsula of Sydney Harbour in close proximity to the city, the Royal Botanic Gardens and the Sydney Harbour Bridge. It's the result of a design by Danish architect Jorn Utzon, who won an international architectural competition that was held in 1956. The Opera House was constructed over 16 years between 1958 and 1973, and it was opened six years late, eventually costing over $102 million, 10 times its original budget. Fortunately, it was substantially financed by a public lottery, but the budget overspend caused an irreparable rift between the government of the day and the Utzon design team. Materials, un, materials that were really unprecedented in terms of architectural forms and their adaptation demanded new technology. The experimental nature of the engineering required equally creative inspiration from Anglo-Danish engineer Ove Arup, who worked closely with Utzon to resolve the extraordinary concrete structure, and the builders M. R. Hornibrook, who in collaboration turned Utzon's vision into Sydney's reality. Their methods were collaborative and evolutionary. Their prototypes of architectural engineering and computing solutions were quite unique at the time. But they were very time consuming and they were very costly. And in 1966, after much public debate about the rising costs of the project, Jorn Utzon and his family left Sydney a full six years before the building was completed. And sadly, he never returned. At that time, there was a change of state government which brought about major changes to the design brief for the building and the required Australian architects who took over the projects, Hall, Todd and Littlemore, had to recommend radical changes to the building's interiors and its present interiors are largely attributed to Peter Hall on the left. Opened in 1973, the Opera House has become a much-loved icon of the city uh, and in 2007 it was World Heritage listed. To see the Opera House on a sunny morning with its white sails glinting in the blue sky and yachts racing past is to be left in awe of this designer and the courage with which he and his collaborators pursued his vision. There are three groups of interlocking vaulted shells which cover respectively the two main performance halls and a restaurant set atop a terraced podium surrounded by a harbourside pedestrian concourse. The site is five acres. It has more than a 1,000 rooms and seven major performing venues, together with extensive retail and dining venues. There are more than 440 staff these days, and there's more than 7.5 million visitors every year, of whom only 1.2 million are patrons who attend the 2,500 events and performances annually. However, this wonderful building has some acknowledged functional problems. The orchestra pits are totally inadequate. The delivery facilities are totally dysfunctional. Some of the acoustics are unsatisfactory, and access for disabled patrons is very poor. Resolving these weaknesses are long-term projects, and they're very costly. The day-to-day -day activities of Australia's busiest performing arts centre requires a building asset management system that's very swiftly responsive to everyday needs. However, we have to recognise that the building and the fabric of the place is of world, national and indeed local significance. And the conservation of these heritage values is therefore a priority for the authorities as well as the building operators. This is a building that's much loved and it's much touched. If you stand for very long near the Sydney Opera House, you'll see that it's an incredibly tactile place. And whilst its fabric is robust, maintenance and visitor management are in very insistent demands. Financially, the house earns more from its food and beverage than it does from its box office receipts. As you might imagine, there's a lot of pressure to increase the amount of food and beverage outlets that are there. The public expenditure purse is very tight and public expectations are very high. There were very loudly expressed views when the site came up for World Heritage Listing that this would complicate things very, even further. There was definitely in-house resistance. But unusually, and really very importantly, the 2007 World Heritage nomination dossier noted that the use and the function of the house was an integral part of its significance, just as much as its fabric, and that change and adaptation of the property would be ongoing. The World Heritage dossier notes, and this is readily accessible online, notes that the work that was already underway on the Western Loggia and the completion of the Utzon Room, which happened in 2004, would be part of what would happen on a daily basis and going into the future. Um, the essential role of the design principles was also noted, and the conservation plan framework within which we work ensures that authenticity and integrity would be maintained. And I want to talk to you a little bit in detail about that.
The ICOMOS report to the World Heritage Committee assessed the nomination and it confirmed that the management framework that was in place was satisfactory. It noted that the changes introduced over the construction period would be, con be considered to be the natural result of the development of a living monument and that it didn't jeopardise its intrinsic values. Now, it's interesting that this was happening at exactly the same time as Palmio was being, had its nomination withdrawn and didn't proceed um, when it was being criticised perhaps for the level of change that had already happened. Here, we had a nomination that was going forward saying, this place will continue to change, it will not remain the same. However, it's often sometimes quite difficult to manage some of the competing interests that you might imagine from the photographs that you've seen. I'd like to stress that the performance needs don't override the heritage requirements of the place. All of the works projects are assessed using the standard Australian practice of heritage impact assessment. What's different at the Opera House is that the significance of the place is its performance role. Its functional use is an attribute of its heritage significance just as much as its form, its fabric, its setting. And so the impacts have to be assessed on a whole range of attributes and they have to be balanced. This is quite difficult. So that if we, um, sorry, I'll just go back one. If we thought about a simple operational change, just as, as replacing a floor covering or changing the stair <coughs> handrails to relate to a basic code requirement, they might ensure the functional capacity of the place and they may well meet the occupational health and safety requirements, but they could also adversely affect the heritage significance. So we needed to think through a little bit beyond the standard conservation plan uh, methodology as to how we would deal with making small cumulative changes as well as the big changes that we needed to make as well. So we worked through a simple methodology for assessing these aspects and for avoiding the impacts. So everyday site management works within a very complex web of local statutory planning and building controls and codes. There are state heritage regulations, there are health and building regulations, and of course there's the federal government responsibilities for World Heritage Convention. We have a bilateral agreement which was negotiated between the state and the federal government so that the state actually takes care of all the approvals processes and it just lets the federal government know about it if they think there's any major issues. Of course, what one thinks is major and what the other thinks is major sometimes is the subject of debate. However, we do have the essential reference documents that we're able to work with and, and these are the two that I'd like to take you through now. There's a policy-oriented conservation management plan, a standard conservation management plan that follows the outline that Susan showed earlier. And then there's also the visionary Utsun design principles, which I'm going to talk about now in some detail. Over the last decade, Australia has been fortunate enough to enjoy a most unusual re-engagement with Jorn Utsun and his architect, Sun Yan, to contribute to the ongoing evolution of the building. We've had extraordinary access to the first-hand knowledge about how and why the building was built the way it is, and the creator's insight into the way the building might evolve. This very unusual relationship began in 1999, when the then State Premier, the Honourable Bob Carr, invited Jorn Utzon to document his original design intentions for posterity, and also, most importantly, to advise on future work. Utzon's re-engagement, in collaboration with a distinguished Australian architect, Richard Johnson, and his form, Johnson, Pilton Walker, opened a new era of projects for the house. The Sydney Opera House Trust by then had 30 years of practical experience with the building, its performance and its problems. Utzon had been reflecting on his own ideas and how they had evolved and matured. At the time that this re-engagement started, Utzon was 84 years of age and his son, Jan, was a key collaborator in his practice. The Utsun design principles were prepared in 2002. They were compiled through long meetings, conversations and correspondence between Denmark and Australia, and the text was approved by Jorn himself. The principles' purpose was to provide a permanent reference source for the building, its setting, for everybody involved in its care and its development. It sets out, in Utsun's own words, the sources of inspiration for his vision and provides an insight into his design methodology and the ideas that he used. It gives us ongoing guidance and inspiration for any proposed changes. The publication of the design principles was accompanied by a venue improvement plan and a substantial budget for works, really the first major investment that the house had had. And several projects by the Utsun Johnson Pilton Walker group followed, including the first Utsun interior space, the Utsun room in 2004, the conversion of the former reception room. <coughs> In 2006, the second major project was the construction of a new loggia on the western city side of the podium, 
which linked theatre foyers with the harbour via a wonderful colonnade, very much in dialogue with the character and the design palette of Utzon's original work. This demonstrated how change could be successfully accommodated within the framework of both the design principles and the conservation plan. There is also a wonderful but unyet, as yet unexecuted design proposal for the majestic renewal of the Opera Theatre. It was documented by the Utzon PTW team in 2007, but it awaits some financial support to make it actually happen. So the Utzon design principles is a, a quite unique part of the conservation management plan. There have been three conservation management plans for the house. Uh, this is the, the uh, current one, but there is also one that's in preparation at the present time. The 2003 conservation plan, um, which was prepared by Dr. James Semple Kerr, one of the architects of conservation philosophy um, for Australia, um, uh, was, is very much the statutory document. But we have a practice in Australia that these documents are, are uh, reviewed every five years or when major change is about to take place. So in 2011, we began uh, to start a new conservation plan and we needed to think about how we would more closely integrate the Utzon design principles and how we would particularly deal with it on a policy by policy basis. So the new, the new conservation plan, which is not yet in the public domain, so you're, you're seeing something a little bit ahead of its um, publication at the present time, sets out three major policies and then has five specific um, policies for each component. Every single component has a policy. The setting, the exteriors, the interiors, the doors, the furniture, everything has a policy. And this is particularly to help us with the asset managers who on a day-by-day -day basis need to do things. They need to have a reference document that they can look at very quickly and make a decision. They don't want to take the time to call the conservation architect and have a chat with him. They need to know what to do right away. And we needed to provide that kind of level of detail for them. So there's two major conservation policies that are, are really basic to this. There's hundreds of them, but let's just dwell on these two. One is about the issue of sensitivity for change. This is a new concept that's coming through in conservation management plans now in Australia. Uh, and it talks about making sure that all of the elements are being maintained and used and managed. And we, worked out, we work out how or whether the higher the significance or sensitivity, sensitivity to change, the greater the level of care and consideration is needed. Now, I'll show you how that works in a, in a case study in a moment. But it's really important to understand the relationship between those two things because that's how the decision making works. We also have the, the somewhat uh, perhaps competitive nature of the fact that some of the interiors and certainly the exterior are Utzon and most of the interiors are Hall. Who has the primacy? Which actual design are we following? Now Utzon um, was very generous. He believed that um, he would, the building was, was finished in a, in a very appropriate way and that it wasn't essential for anything to return to his original design objectives. He was very complimentary about Hall and his work. So here we are suggesting through this conservation policy that all future designers need to accept and relate to those two designers and that new design work shouldn't contrast or compete with them but be read as subtle and sympathetic in addition to the existing work. So each conservation policy is preceded by an excerpt from the Utzon design principles. So here you see them in blue. They may be a little bit hard to read in the distance but you'll get the idea the blue is the Utzon design principles, the black is the explanation of the uh, actual policy. And then on the right hand side, and we'll see one of those in a little bit more detail, sorry, in a moment, is actually how we work through the policy of sensitivity for change. So what we do is we try to establish what the relative significance of every element is. Say it's the floor, it's the sail, it's the handrail. We identify which attribute contributes to that significance. Is it its form, its fabric, its function, its location, or is it indeed intangible values? And we then assess the tolerance for change or sensitivity to change. Those terms are used a little bit interchangeably. And we develop policies that will help us relate to those. Now, they have to relate to all of the different elements. They have to relate to the, to the chairs, to the green room, to the sails, to the tiles, to the pipe organ. And here's how it works. So just taking the, um, the conservation policy of the roof shells externally, um, we have a bit of a description of them, how much sensitivity to change there is, and any particular further considerations that are necessary. Now this is a lot to take on in a very small um, lecture theatre, and I, and I do direct you to have a look at it when it comes up onto the website. But this is a new way forward of dealing with the integration of the original architect's ideas and his design principles with practical conservation philosophy.
So I've been asked particularly to focus on re-engaging with the original designers today, and I guess it's a really an opportunity and a management aspect that's quite unique to places of 20th century heritage significance, that potential for re-engagement. And we had a, a, a large conference in Australia in 2009 called the Unloved Modern Conference, and it was partly held at the Sydney Opera House, and we explored some of the ambiguities about whether the creator has privileges over the conservator through a series of national and international papers which were available on the ECOMOS website. I've personally now had the professional pleasure of being part of a team re-engaging with three prominent architects in this particular way to manage Australian buildings which are heritage listed. We worked with John Andrews um, on his remarkable Callum Offices building in Canberra, 1973 to 77, and there we efficiently developed a brief hierarchy of principles to be used in considering future changes as part of the preparation of a CMP, although we did spend a lot of time talking about the politics of architectural competitions with John, which he's very strong about. I've also worked with uh, Harry Seidler, and there we, we really debated at length his very strong preference for improving the fabric and the construction of his 1948 Rose Seidler house when he restored and gifted it to the, the property to the state in 1988. He was a driving force for it becoming a house museum, and he really wanted it preserved at its best. He was an example of the uh, creator taking over from the conservator. More recently, we finalised architectural guidelines for the future management of Seidler's premier office concept, uh, Australia Square, built in 1961 to 67, with Seidler's design partners and his wife, Penelope. And there we've been posthumously interpreting Seidler's original vision and his design principles for Australia Square as it goes through commercial refits and uh, reprints. Unsurprisingly, the outcome of each of these experiences was largely driven by the personality of the individual architect and his sympathy or lack of sympathy for the conservation process and philosophy that was generally the way in which it was being conserved. With Utzon, the self-effacing nature of the man dictated his approach. His personal collaboration with Richard Johnson and his passion for the building, and is, which is equaled by his son Jan, who visits Sydney every six months, has formed a uniquely successful partnership for successful re-engagement. The temptation um, to reconstruct what Utzon had planned in the 1960s, but which wasn't delivered in the work that followed his departure from Sydney, had been a matter for a great deal of debate. But Utzon himself actually rejected this idea. He said it wouldn't be right to go back to the ideas. They were based on a, a different program. I'd uh, like to close with Utzon's own words when he accepted the re-engagement, the role to develop the design principles. He said, as the, as the architect of the Sydney Opera House, as the creative force behind its character, I sincerely believe that a large multi-purpose structure such as this building in time will undergo many natural changes. The ideas as they were developed in the 60s evolved as a result of needs and techniques at that time. But as time passes and needs change, it is natural to modify the building to suit the needs and techniques of the day. The changes, however, should be such that the original character of the building is maintained. That is to say, I certainly condone the changes at the Sydney Opera House, both changes due to general maintenance and changes done due to functional changes. Had I completed the Sydney Opera House as the architect in charge, the building would have developed and changed with time ever since. The Utzon Room epitomises the outcome of that happy re-engagement, but these opportunities are fleeting and they're diminishing rapidly. A few years ago, the 20th Century Committee and Docomoma organised Sunday evening fireside chats at the Rose Seidler House Museum with Sydney's post-war architects. They were reminiscing about their work. For some, it was the first time they had been invited to reflect publicly upon their careers. Identifying and documenting these opportunities for practical and honest re-engagement with the original architects and designers is a challenge and a potential benefit to us all and something that I think I'd like to suggest as a priority for our work here. Thank you.